Hey everybody, thanks for checking in for our youth Sunday School lesson this morning. Hope everybody's doing well. I want to tell you about a couple things going on so you can mark your calendars in case you haven't already heard this. On Saturday, August the 15th, we're going to have a work day along with our men's construction team at a church on Highway 25 going toward Wilsonville. Uh, we're going to be doing some work at that church on that Saturday starting anytime after 6 a.m. that you want to come. Uh, we bring a lunch with you. We'll have some water and stuff available, and there's going to be all kind of tasks all around the church. So it's a family opportunity for you to come. We'll be able to spread out and hopefully get some things knocked out for this church plant that's getting ready to open. We want to support that. Then I want to tell you about an event we've got planned for our students. It's our first one. We're calling it the kickoff, and I got together with the youth pastors of several area churches, and we're planning a kickball tournament on Wednesday night, August the 19th, at the Columbiana Ball Fields over there by the Sheriff's Department. It's going to start at 6. We'll finish it up around 8. We're going to have food for you to eat. we got some giveaways we're going to have for everybody who shows up. And it'll just be a kickball tournament. It'll just be fun. We're just looking to get everybody together, have a time of fellowship, and do something outside where everybody can kind of spread out. August the 15th, we're for sure having a work day that Saturday. And August the 19th, at this point, we're planning to have the kickoff. I'm really excited about it. I hope you'll tell your friends about it, and I hope you'll be there. Because I want to see you guys. I haven't seen a lot of you since all this started. So I hope you'll be able to put that on your calendar and make it. Now, for Sunday School this morning, if you got your Bibles, open them up to John. We're going to be in the Gospel of John, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and we're going to start in chapter 10. Let's read some verses together. Verse 7 is where we're going to start. It says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Now, this is a heavy passage, okay? This is Jesus giving an analogy of a shepherd and his sheep. And he is talking to his disciples, to his listeners, and letting them know who he is in relation to who they are and the dangers that are out there. He mentions the wolves. So let's kind of break this down. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think the wolves that Jesus might be referencing are in this story? If you said the Pharisees, you got it right. Jesus was talking about the Pharisees and how they laid down all their laws for the people and made up all these things that people were to go through. And he's comparing them to the bad shepherd because they were only really interested in themselves. You know, he talks about the hired hand, that person who's out watching the sheep, but he doesn't own the sheep. He's just hired in to watch them. And when a wolf comes, instead of risking his life to protect the sheep, it says that the hired hand, he's going to run away. He's going to get out of there because he doesn't have ownership in these sheep and he wants to preserve and save his life. Well, think about what Jesus does for us as the good shepherd. And what he's done for you and me is that he was willing to fight the wolves off and be willing to give up his life to the wolves, the Pharisees, the people who wanted him dead. He was willing to give that life up for our protection. Now, this is relevant for us today. We don't have a group called the Pharisees running around Columbiana trying to pull us away. But there are people who want to pull us away from the Good Shepherd. There are people who want to find ways to keep us from having relationship with him. So let me ask you this. What are some of the characteristics of those thieves and robbers and wolves that would come in and seek to, as Jesus said, kill, steal, and destroy? 
Uh, what are those things that would take you away from who Christ is? Well, I'll tell you one of the big things. In our culture today, we have what you would call a pluralistic society. Everybody kind of thinks that they have their own answers, their own way to God. But Jesus said very clearly in John, John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that truth in today's culture is not a very popular truth because, in a way, it is seen as exclusive because you're saying, well, Jesus is the only way. Absolutely. In that sense, maybe it is exclusive. But if you read John 3, 16, where it says that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world so that anybody who believed in him could come to God, it's very inclusive. So don't let people convince you that the idea of only having one way to God is wrong. It's not. It's the best idea. It's the truest idea. Jesus said that it's available to anybody. It's not exclusive in any way unless you reject him. There has to be a system of checks and balances, and there has to be a sense of right and wrong. And so if God could just let anyone into heaven, regardless of all the bad things that they did, God would no longer be a righteous judge because our sin requires a payment. Our sin requires some kind of a punishment. Well, we could never pay that price on our own. So Christ paid it for us on the cross so that now we can accept that payment for our sins and we can be forgiven and God can allow us to be with him in heaven and still be a righteous God because we our sins have been forgiven. They've been paid for and they've been paid for by the blood of Jesus. So it's a very important principle. It runs all through the pages of John. Now, let's look at some scriptures that kind of make a few points about this passage. Just to try to help you understand this sacrificial death of Jesus and what he did on the cross, I want to read you some verses. The first one is going to be out of Romans chapter 5. It's going to be verses 6 through 8. This verse tells us that what God did in Jesus dying on the cross was God demonstrated his love for us. Let's read it together. Romans 5, starting verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will a person die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God was showing us his love on the cross. He demonstrated it for us. Also, Jesus' death on the cross was the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Now, what that word atonement means basically is it was the payment for our sins. So not only was God showing us that he loves us and demonstrating that, he was going through the process of paying for our sins with the blood of Jesus, that atonement for our sins. Let's look in 1 John chapter 4. Here's what verse 10 says. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's really important that it says we didn't love God first. He loved us. And because of that, he was willing to pay for our sins. So Jesus' death on the cross was an atoning sacrifice for our sins. A third thing that happened on the cross was that it reconciled us with God. You ever had an argument with somebody, somebody that you loved, and there was a rift between you, and, and you couldn't really have a good relationship because something needed to be forgiven? Well, our sin causes that between us and God on a huge scale. And the idea of reconciliation, when two people come together and forgive and move on, that reconciliation was accomplished for us on the cross. In fact, Peter has something to say about it. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. His death accomplished this reconciliation where we can be in the presence of God again because our sins can be forgiven. And there's one more thing I want to point out from this lesson about what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross did when he was being our good shepherd, the one who was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And this is great for us because it means that we no longer have to fear death. Death doesn't have to be something that we fear. Now, with that said, death is not necessarily something that we all are excited about. I mean, we still feel like we have a lot of living left to do. But if you read Paul and some of the things that he had to say, he talked about how being absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so if we realize that when we take our last breath here as a child of God, our next breath is in heaven with our Lord, we're not going to be disappointed. We're not going to miss this life. But as long as God gives us breath, he gives us work to do and things to accomplish. And we should be excited about that. And we should enjoy this life and, and find joy in this life. God wants us to live a life that is abundant. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all going to have everything go smooth and we're never going to have any problems. 
What that means is no matter what we face, we can live with the joy of knowing that one day we'll be with God. Along the path, though, in this life, there are so many wonderful things that we get to experience and we should be grateful for. I want to read you a passage out of Hebrews chapter 2 that talks about how we no longer have to fear death. It starts in verse 14. Here's what it says. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death. So Christ died and accomplished so many things, the last of which we just mentioned was that we no longer have to fear death. Let's recap this. Christ's death on the cross showed God's love for us. It atoned for our sins. It reconciled and gave us a relationship with God. And it gives us the freedom not to have to fear death anymore. He accomplished so much more than that. That's just what we're going to highlight today. Uh, thanks for tuning in for our Sunday School lesson. I'd encourage you to be in the Word this week. Don't forget to tune in Wednesday night for our weekly Bible study at 6 p.m. It will debut on Facebook and YouTube. And I'm excited about the things we've got coming up and crossing my fingers and hoping that we're going to be able to start school and get back into some kind of a routine so that we can get back to life as we know it. Hopefully, we've all learned some things through this quarantine. Hopefully, maybe you've changed some habits you had that you were running so crazy that you never had time to, to sit down and to read your Bible or you never had time to sit down and think about your life. And, you know, you may have made it all the way through this quarantine without doing that, but my hope for you, my prayer for you, is that you've had the chance to take a moment and just breathe over the past few months and just think about where your life is and where your relationship is with Christ. And I just want to encourage you, as we get back into this routine of life, as things start to go back to normal, whenever that may be, and, and we all look forward to it for different reasons, don't forget that we need to set aside time to work on our relationship with God because you can't build a relationship with Him if you never spend any time with Him. And I just want to encourage you to do that. And just by the fact that you watch this Sunday School video to the end tells me that maybe you're, you're working on it or maybe your parents are making you watch it. I don't know. But I hope you have an awesome week and don't forget to check in Wednesday. Take care.